actually uh, I'm getting super nervous as <laughs> well. Uh, hi everyone, so it's very nice to meet you all here. Uh, so the topic I'm going to share today is uh, from idea to a product. Yeah, I hope my phone is a remote controller, I'm more like <laughs> checking messages. So, yeah. so I'll just quickly introduce myself a little bit. Then my Chinese name is John Hong, uh, but everyone just call me Rock. And I'm a software engineer at TikTok, that previous at TikTok. Then I just moved to Singapore last year from Shanghai. Uh, yeah. So uh, here today, I want to change my title a little bit to uh, Indie Developer because I want to uh, share with you some of my own experience in making my Indie products as the Indie Developer today. So if you ask me, like, uh, um, what's the differences between being an Indie Developer and being an engineer in a company, especially in a relatively big company. And I think one of the most important thing for me is, as an indie developer, you have the opportunity to be involved in like a lot of different roles uh, at different stages in the product life cycle. And because of it, so you may have quite a different experience compared to what as a software engineer at a big company. Um, like from the PM who thinks about the product, the ideas, and to the designer who cares about the UI, UX experience, or like engineer that we are more familiar with, like you create the code, you program, you like just implement everything, then there's just more parts during the whole development process that you will need to be involved in. And even after you finish the product, the development, and you may still need to like be responsible for like the marketing, sales, and even for customer service. So I feel this is something quite difficult like to have the opportunity to, to, to try all these kind of different roles in the big company. So for me, this kind of experience actually can help me to think about like, how I can work better as a software engineer, with, especially with different function roles in the company. So when you need to collaborate with different people, so you can think about like uh, your own experience when you try to do this uh, different things. Yeah. So mm, the story I'm going to share today is the story of my very first app uh, that was designed and developed by myself back to 2017, and it's called Mr. Weather. Yeah. So uh, this is my very first. Uh, Product that I started developing it uh, back to the summer of 2016, and that's during my sophomore year in my uni. Yeah, so because it's my first in the app, so this product may look quite naive now and could be improved in a lot of different ways if I can do it again today. But I feel just like because it's my first uh, experience of making a product from scratch by myself. So I think it might be more helpful for uh, someone who may want to try to make their own product as well, yeah, just like me at that time. So first, we will start the story uh, from the product part. So because a lot of people will ask me, like, I want to make a product, but I just don't really have an idea. I don't know where to start. Then I remember that's one time I was reading an article uh, on Medium like, quite a long time ago. Then in that article, they mentioned about great products, they don't really happen by accident. But well, for me, that this Mr. Weather app, it just come out, um, um, I just suddenly I come out with this idea, I want to make a programmer style weather app. Then, so it's totally by accident for me. So yeah, probably my product is not really a very good product from the moment I had the idea, anyway. Yeah, so here's the Mr. Weather look like at the very first beginning. So the interface was quite similar to the terminal, as you can see here, then where you can just type in different commands to check the weather of a city or something like this. So under this definition of the programmer style, uh, that I was chosen for back to that time. I even added a chatbot, like this kind of functionality. Um, then overall visual style was also trying to like, 
uh, to, to emit the, the pixel style I was wanting to, to create that kind of things. Then the, uh, when I was still a sophomore student in college, I thought it was just too cool to be true. Yeah, so then, but still I, I showed this prototype to one of my friends uh, when I was entering at my very first uh, company in Beijing in the summer of my sophomore year. Then I still remember how my friends talked to me at the time. Like he said, it looks very interesting, but somehow I feel, yeah, um, you made this product just to entertain yourself. Because, like, because like when I really thought about it, I feel like it's quite true. Because even I am a, I, I'm a software engineer, but no one wants to, like, when you want to check weather, then you pick up your phone, then just tap weather dash update, weather dash temperature, Singapore, this kind of things, right? So I started to think more seriously about like, how I can make a really useful product for more people, not even like, just entertain myself. So then I started to think about, like, I started to reflect on the motivation and scenarios. Like every time I want to check a weather. So I think for most users here, or most of, um, except for some like professional users, then they care about the occurring numbers of the data. But for most of users, we don't really care about the data. We don't really care about the numbers. But we care more is for um, how the data, the weather, will affect us in making different kind of decisions, or what kind, or what kind of actions we need to take after we check the weather, right? So after carefully observing myself and also <coughs> some of my friends, I separate into the requirements or the scenarios uh, into two different categories of scenarios at that time. So one is more like a regular routine, like for example. Uh, you may like me, like every morning you pick up your phone and check today's weather. It's going to rain or not, it's going to like, it's going to be very hot or not. This kind of like a routine, regular actions. Then another category is relatively random, like for example, uh, when the sky, when, when you're about to get out and you find the sky is getting darker, then you suddenly hear, oh, the thunderstorm is coming, or something like that, then you open your phone and try to check the real-time weather, right? So, yeah, for the first category, then for other routines or this kind of regular actions, I made uh, one of the most important features in this weather is called customized weather condition trigger. So basically, this feature means you can customize all the conditions you want as a trigger to send you notifications. So you can also customize the like, weather uh, monitoring time and the like the notification pushing time all the different kind of conditions you can try to customize. So you can create something like, uh, reminds me to uh, wear a mask in the morning if the air quality index is higher than 100, or like it reminds me to take the umbrella uh, if the next day's uh, rainfall possibility is higher than 50%, this kind of things. So these regular routines can be, I feel this kind of regular routines can be completely uh, monitored by Mr. Weather automatically and it will remind you like, when you really need it to care about it. So I hope my users, by using this kind of feature, you don't really have to check the weather manually every time, like every morning. So you can just rely on Mr. Weather. It will send you the notification at the right time. Then for another type of the more random scenario I mentioned earlier, the solution I give is to tell the user all the information and that he cares most of all in the most intuitive way when the user wants to check it. So the app has four different types of cards, like this kind of cards. Then with dozens of sub-items, you can just fully customize every card, and every screen in, in this app. And the user, the app also has a widget uh, with all the web animations, uh, trying to allow users can be, uh, get the info as fast as possible about the like, trends of the weather or how the weather will affect him uh, rather than just uh, weather numbers. Yeah, so I feel one thing I really feel uh, quite touched me a lot, like really nice me here is uh, this quote from Larry Tesla uh, that I read from a book called Living with Complexity. So because we always want to, we, want, or we always want users to feel like my product is very easy to use 
or like this very intuitive for them to, to operate. But trying to achieve this kind of things often means that designers and the developers, they have to deal with more complexity. Like for example, uh, one feature we use a lot, like iPhone's feature, Touch ID or Face ID, then it frees the user from the complexity of entering password every time you want to unlock your phone, right? But behind this Touch ID or Face ID feature, it's definitely more complex in engineering and design, right, than just supporting the password. So in Mr. Weather's case, I wanted to uh, let my users to feel very easy to start to use and very intuitive when they use my app. So like, you, you just get a notification at the right time when you need it, right? But when making the product, then we definitely need to deal with more complexity than like, just making the weather app with numbers like, on the screen. So after thinking about the ideas of the product, then I think we are ready to uh, start doing the design. So this is the second part of the product life cycle for me. So I feel some design tool that you may already be quite familiar with, uh, such as Sketch, Figma, that uh, some of you must use a lot before. Then, so here I won't waste your time in introducing how to use a particular tool, design tool in specific. So, but instead I would like to uh, introduce a few concepts of how I finished Mr. Weather's design. So it's just a way to introduce a few things that I feel uh, can be helpful, but for people like who are not very familiar with UI or UX design yet, they may not like notice this kind of things before. Yeah. So first is about uh, the style and the structure. So to put it in a nutshell, what kind of feelings you want to create and what kind of feelings you want to bring to your users? Then, when they started, once they started to use your app, to use your product. So I feel the style can be like something very simple, like cool or cyberpunk, right? Or something can uh, bring you this uh, very calm feelings, like Zen style, or like welcoming, all these kind of things. Just like a feeling or style you want to create for your users. Then you got the idea. Here. So at that time, I only have a very, how to say, like shallow understanding. Uh, on like, designing about like, styles. So at that time, I just felt, wow, something like very pure, very simple, very clean, that can be quite sexy in a digital product, right? because I really like this kind of style. So at that time, every time I saw something, like, I, I don't know if you know, there's a website called Dribble. So Dribble is a website like designers who have posted their draft designs. So yeah, it's basically like designers GitHub, you can understand it that way. Yeah, so um, every time I, I, I found some like a design, uh, they, they really didn't really care a lot of, like carry a lot of information, but just had a very nice, uh, how to say, like layout, visual, or rendering, that kind of stuff. I was starting to feel something like, wow, it's damn nice, right? Then, then I realized that what is really hard to achieve is not just a word about simple or norm. So as we mentioned earlier, when the experience we want is to bring the users about like, something intuitive, something very simple, something very user-friendly, then it often means that we as a designer or as engineers, we need to manage more complexity uh, in advance. So not just by cutting all the requirements to achieve simplicity, but cutting requirements is something I they did a lot in the company, so <laughs> just back in here, all the designers, uh, can we just remove these requirements in the company? Right? So, in fact, like many many designers, we have similar opinions here, uh, such as one designer that probably like if you are an iOS developer or you are an Apple fan, then you will be quite familiar with. There is a profound uh, so in clarity. I think there is a profound and enduring beauty in simplicity, in clarity, in efficiency. True simplicity is derived from so much more than just the absence of clutter and ornamentation. It's about bringing order to complexity. So, you may have seen this video before. Uh, here is, uh, his name is Johnny Ive, that's uh, Apple's 
uh, designer before, right? So I feel like here John Ive gives us a, a quite similar idea. So that is like true simplicity. It's not just an absence of clutter and no limitation. It's about like, bringing order to complexity. Or in other words, we mentioned earlier, it's about managing all the complexity. So like back to the design topic we mentioned earlier, then you open the, like a sketch or fake file and like this kind of design software, then every time we will start from a blank board, right? Then where should we start? Where should we begin to do the design? So I think probably like uh, mm, it's better not to just like drag some controls and you should start to uh, draw something on the board, or dragging things around and start to uh, adjust all the details. Uh, but actually we can try to start by thinking about the uh, information we want to uh, or we need to carry on the beginning that uh, when we start to uh, design the experience. I think it's quite similar, like just like when we write a code and when we do a design, technical design, we probably don't really start obsessing about the UI code of a view or the specific implementation of a piece of business logic. But instead, at the beginning, we can define the structure of the entire life cycle, the data flow, or the protocols first, right? Then you can determine like, the information we want to communicate at each different levels. So I think at this point, like we have the design and programming, the engineering has similar concept. So here's the part of the structure that I designed for Mr. Weather. So based on the definition of the product and the style I talked before. Uh, I play any oh, yeah. Yeah. So the overall style is I want to uh, present, it's like I present here is about clean and clarity. That kind of feeling I want to bring to my users. Yeah, so the next part I want to talk about the design is font. So speaking of font, I guess maybe some of you here uh, will use fonts just like this, just like how I choose from before. It's like we just open the front picker up here, then I try this one, I try that one, I try another one, then probably we'll try the art from from the PowerPoint, right? Until you find just what makes you feel mm, this looks great. <laughs> like and here you can use this from. Yeah, that's how I use from before. So, but actually a front can be more than just how it looks like. So can we take a look at this front I listed here, I showed over here, and see if you can find, we can, if you can notice any differences here between these two groups of fronts. Yeah, so for the front on the left side, if you also grew up in mainland China, or you used some mainland Chinese developed a software or product or their video, photos before, I guess you must, I have seen this front before. Yeah, so, yeah, just a little bit more time here then. Before I tell you the answer, then I can, uh, let me share a true story about from uh, having myself before. So I remember this when I was an intern at my very first company. This one year, uh, we had a Hexon event that was held in the uh, hotel in Shanghai. So at that time, when I was waiting for the lift, then I saw a printed notice uh, posted on the lift door. Then uh, after reading it, I said to my friends, then, I guess this hotel must be operated by some companies from Hong Kong or someone from Hong Kong. Then we just Google it, then found that it's really a hotel brand from Hong Kong. So yeah, why? Then the first thing, let me tell you the answer of these two different groups of front on this page. Yeah, so the front on the left side is like called Sim Zong, like Zhong Yi Zong Ti. And the front on the right side is called Yi Liu, uh, Sim Sim Wen Ti. So for, this, uh, for those of you are, like, who are not very familiar with Chinese language or Chinese characters or like history, so the Song and the Ming here actually refers to two Chinese dynasty in ancient China. So the Song Dynasty is around uh, 600 to 1180, then the Ming Dynasty is around 30 to 1680. That's quite a long time ago. So why I just said the front on the left side, you must have seen it before if you like grew up in mainland China or used their software or used their before. 
So let me change the look a little bit. So it might look more familiar to you. So if I change to this like a more low resolution and dot matrix style, uh, it's because this is a default front, uh, default like simplified Chinese front in Windows XP. <laughs> so the front on the right side is the main front, right? So which is also the default default Chinese front, but it's for the traditional Chinese character release of Windows like Windows 2000 and Windows XP. So it was more widely used in Hong Kong or Macro, but the left side is more widely used in mainland China. So that's the difference. So if we compare the Ming style front with Song style front here, which is more frequently used in mainland China, so actually they are very close in style. If you are not very familiar with the first glance, you'll take a look. If it's quite familiar, it looks really quite similar, right? The, yeah, then they're both like thrift like style uh, Chinese from and the story of the origin of of their name is also very interesting. Uh, if you're interested, you can like Google it later. Then about the story behind the Lin front and the Song uh, Song style front, it's actually more than the dynasty I mentioned before. It has some like little mistake inside, and also has some like complex complicated relationship between. Uh, China, Japan, Korea, these kind of things. So we have these two different names. So back to our topic. So the difference is that the Song style from has a more, on the, on the mainland, uh, is mostly uh, in the new form after the reform of the Chinese character, which happened in England. But in the Ming style from using Hong Kong and Kong is mostly in the old form of the Chinese characters. So you can see those two uh, sides of the front that we have some different treatment in some strokes details, like from opening and some other details in all these details are quite different. And I mentioned that the Ming style form is more widely used in Hong Kong and Macau. So if I add another Ming style form here, you might be more familiar with this, this one. So this form is called Hua Kang Sinter Ming Tia. It's still a Ming front in Chinese. So this is a front that was used in earlier days of Hong Kong's MTR. We call MTR by MIT. <laughs> Yeah, and later the NTR gradually began to use the new front. Uh, you can still find very obvious style continuity. So to summarize it, this like, whole section of front. So what I want to say here is, the differences between different fronts is often more than just how they look differently. But the style of different front often carries a very strong history related information and regional background. So they may bring a very different uh, feelings to your users and to your readers. So it's not really about how it just looks different. So yeah, back to uh, Mr. Weather's choice of front. And I was hated for uh, quite a while about this. And that's several of my candidates at that time at the open sense in the top, which the Google developer is an open source uh, front, which want to uh, bring, like Google defines as a neutral and no approachable front. It's also very easy to read on digital uh, devices. Then the second one is called Helvetica, um, which is a very famous one, and probably already know about it. Then it is very Hel Helvetica, called Helvetica Nui, like where the system default from um, iOS, microOS devices for a long time until like uh, around I was nine, we changed the default front from Helvetica to San Francisco. And if you care about the front one, well, that's the time a lot of people will complain about it. Right. Then, yeah, at that time, remember we had an article, uh, I read an article from like, some media, and they said like, Apple just changed the most beloved front. They said how the, the Helvetica is. Oh, it's the last one. But then the main front I chose for Mr. Weather at that time was uh, GearSense. So GearSense is available as a present for both iOS and macOS. And they offer like five different front widths and two side options. Then GearSense is known as a British Helvetica and is used on a large scale in the UK uh, for posters, timetables, clocks, or other scenarios, similar scenarios. So, uh, GearSense has a very distinctive uh, style. For example, here, you can see the intersection part in the uppercase M. 
and also we designed with a more geometric feel, such as the little O, so you can compare to Helvetica here, you will notice that the little O in gear sets is more oriented towards a square circle compared to another one. Yeah, so in particular, I like the design of this from this gear sense from the, especially for the numbers part, and I think it's very suitable for Mr. Weather. Uh, the weather app that includes a lot of scenarios with a large displays of numbers are needed. So I feel like uh, generally it's uh, balanced and it's classic, simple, and very easy to read. So I feel it was very close to the uh, curve and clarity that I feel I want to bring to Mr. Weather. So I chose this from for my app. So then after we choose the front, then Mr. Weather went in from the structure we just drew before into something like this. But it still looks quite empty, right? It's still like something is missing. So that will bring to the next topic I want to talk about is animations. So Mr. Weather's animations still want to give you the the, the feeling I talked about, like the intuitive, the clean, the simple but natural, that kind of feeling. So the animations for different uh, weather, like sunny, cloudy, raining, snow, also follow the like, overall color scheme uh, of mist weather. And in addition to the large weather animation, I also added several like, small animations uh, to the app. But uh, just want to like follow the overall feelings. So when it comes to the animation, the timing function is quite an important part, uh, but often to be ignored by, especially for engineers, I feel. So the right timing function will make the animation feel more natural and right. So if not, it will make the users feel your animation is quite laggy and sometimes not very necessary. Then here we have, like, for example, here we have four lines. Then the animation duration for all these four lines is actually all one second long. But they are using different timing functions here, so we can give you a quite a different reason, that kind of feelings when you use it, and we can see it again. It's actually all one second long, but we feel the reason are quite different. Yeah, so in fact, the timing function in the animation is actually uh, just a function that defines how your animation progress goes uh, with time. So it's like a function like this. And this is to uh, several different uh, timing functions we uh, showed earlier. So all the types I mentioned earlier are called cubic basis curves. And this curve is used extremely uh, extensively as a curve for controlling animations, uh, including like if you are front end developer in CSS for web, you can use it a lot. And for native developer like iOS or Android developer, you can you may still use it a lot because it's like supported by the system natively. So the cubic basis can be described with just four numbers here, like, like here. So they are corresponding to the x and y coordinates of the two control points, like here. And another common type of timing function is called spring. So I can find uh, there are some, you can find like there are some, sorry. The animation is gone. You can all show the animation here. Oh yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you can find that uh, some bounces here. So spring animation tends to be faster in the early stage and can be uh, flexible, depends on uh, how you configure it with it. So the spring animation can give you a more natural feel. Uh, so it was very widely used in iOS and macOS still. Like for iOS, it's starting from iOS 7, the version like you can a lot of uh, changes being bring in that version. So like the keyboard, like on, on your iPhone, like uh, every time the keyboard uh, popping or every time you uh, a new page being pushed in, they are using this kind of animation called Spring. So then for me, I use a Spring uh, as a timing function for a lot of different animations in my app as well, like this uh, weather chart. Yeah, so that's uh, like some uh, basic concept of the animation part. So after that part, then the last part of design is to perfect all the details. So for me, I really like um, all the products that you can feel they pay a lot of attention to all the details. So when you're starting to use it, you can feel like all the designers, engineers, they spend a lot of time, they spend a lot of efforts in all the details. They have a lot of thoughts on it. 
Uh, details need you to spend time and efforts to polish. Then many companies, especially for I feel for big companies, it's quite hard uh, to have enough time to polish all these kind of details. And because the reason can be like nobody really cares, or they just feel that spending so much time on these details that may not be obvious to the users and not much like not that helpful for all the like indicators everyone cares like conversion, retention, penetration, that kind of stuff, right? So, but if you do care about the details, and making the AD apps can give you a good opportunity in trying to polish and trying to like, tweak all these kinds of things. So, for example, the cut area here uh, at the bottom, I show here on the screen. Um, so, on some devices, you may like just be able to see uh, like two cards in total or three cards in total. Then the, main, the user may not be aware that actually this section can be scrolled, you can scroll to left and to see more cards. Then, so how can we improve it? And a common approach is to show a score indicator, and also like, if we can add a small animations when it pops up, so that users can know, sorry, so the users can know, like, uh, actually, I can scroll the section here. Then I also spent some time in customizing the map style here, so you can see the, the black and white map behind these labels. Then, because I want to make it uh, more consistent with the map's overall theme and all the overall style. And also here are some of my small icons I draw when I design uh, this app. Yeah, so that's something about design. It's quite uh, probably like uh, just some basic ideas about animation in front. But if you are an engineer, if you are a developer, you want to design something, there's something you can like uh, pay a little bit of attention to it. Yeah. So after the design, the next part will be uh, development. So I don't think it's necessary to go through a lot of like technical things here because I guess most of you guys here. Uh, may like a, like me on a daily job or your future job will be programming or like coding every day. So here I just want to mention some points that may not to be like quite the same in making indie apps compared to uh, like work at a big company. So one thing here is some of the corners that we really forgot to uh, care about in our daily development process, or in other words, like some corners that might be often rejected by the reasons like I can do it, but I don't think it's necessary. This is something I hear a lot from like, my previous company's colleagues because sometimes like the designer or the PM or other QA they want to change something, then they will say, I could do maybe you will do it. <laughs> I can do it, but I don't really think it's necessary. Those kind of reasons, right? But uh, yeah. In, in, in indie developer, like, uh, here's a very simple example. So if you have paid attention, then you certainly know, but if you haven't really paid special attention on this kind of topic, then you may feel it's a little different than what you expected, what you thought before. So it's a very simple question. Like in iOS, how do you have a line of image with a label vertically? This looks very simple, right? And probably you are like a junior iOS developer, you know about local layout. I don't know like, uh, how I can do something probably like this. I just create a <laughs> custom, right? I pin the center Y, the anchors from the label to the image. Right? It looks very simple. But if we need to set a line height there, like sometimes a designer want to bring more complex data, I want to change the line height from the default one to more flexible, then you might find it something like this. So here we can set, uh, we will try to set the line height of 30 for label with the font size of 24. So on the design software, the look like this looks quite okay, right? But if you want to do something in like your project, in your code, then the result, it turns out to be like this. It doesn't really look like be a line where right? to be perfectly centralized, uh, centrally vertically. So I know some of my colleagues then, who have seen this kind of situation before, they will say, uh, I need to do some like micro manipulation uh, in Chinese we call wing top <laughs> uh, micro manipulation. Then we'll just try to like L1, L2, L3, or minus one, minus two, and I feel oh, it looks quite okay, it should be okay. <laughs> the designer should, should should be good with it. Right. 
So this is like happened quite a lot in my, uh, not my current company, because all my colleagues here are very brilliant. Yeah. Like for example, uh, the, you open the actual view hierarchy inspector, this is something like in iOS you can help to check the view hierarchy, and you can try to find there's a few pixels, then you just change it manually, it's something to do. But if you take some time here, then you understand the components of the front structure, you can actually get a lot of things here, like of how you can manipulate the front, then you will find the system actually behaves as expected, but you just need to know how you should do, how, how you can calculate the, red, the, the correct adjustment you need to do. You don't really need to just guess, like, and one, and two, minus one, minus two. Yeah, but this is something you really can take some time. So, yeah, it's specific to iOS, but I just take it as a uh, simple example, and I guess in uh, front end, back end, and, and other developer, um, you will have something similar like this. It looks very simple, but actually, there's a lot of things behind it. Yeah, so after completing uh, all the development work, then it looks like we are ready to release, right? Yeah, so I was also very confident about it before, and uh, like I will be like after I finish all the features, and I should be able to release my app very soon. Right? Just like push it to the app store, then next day, boom, I'm a billionaire. <laughs> That's something I expected before. But it was paying special attention to the fact that there's no QA to help you to find, like keep an eye on the quality of the product you make. So moreover, the negative impact of bugs in like an indie developer's app will be more direct and more, I would say, like more meaningful to you than like a, a, a single review for big companies apps. So after users find the, why that? Because like users, they find a problem, they find a bug, then they will probably just go to your Twitter or Weibo or like a set of emails to report bugs. Then I still remember like uh, the day I released my app, and the second day I woke up, and I opened my phone, I picked my phone, and I found my inbox was full of like all the bug reports, <laughs> like more than 50, that kind of stuff really surprised me a lot. Yeah, so uh, more, more even like some users uh, will just uninstall your app, they just delete your app, you won't know about it. Then uh, some users will go to the app store, they will write a review on the app store directly, so especially like when you just like released your app not for very long, then a, a, a like few bad review can very obviously affect your rating because with, like the, the total review number is quite low. So one or two people they go there, give you a one star review, and then we'll find the average star just drops very quickly. Yeah. Then the low rating directly affect the user's first impression of your app. So imagine you search the app, where you just like open the app store, you find an app, one app is five star, another app is three star. It's just like how you choose a restaurant, right? And you definitely will go with the app with highest call. Yeah, that also will affect the numbers of downloads and purchases, all these kind of things. So therefore, combined with this situation and the fact that indie developers often have limited resource and time, the testing process is like, quite important for me. So in addition to the like, familiar like, uh, invitation with test flight emails or posting like, test flight invitations, links on the social media platform, uh, I would like to mention one more platform here. So some friends may not know if they're iOS developer about it, it's called Airport. So on Airport, you can publish your own version of the test flight app. It's like an app store, but uh, for different kind of test flight with like a data testing apps. So you can see like this off-screen developed by one of my, <coughs> my friends um, and being shown on their website now. It's quite useful for UD developers. Okay, then after the successful testing and release, so let's talk about the post-release, like the marketing uh, related phase. Yeah, so I think the three most basic elements or idea uh, that need to be thought of before promotion is like icon, your app's name, and also you need to have a slogan for your app, right? So this is an icon I designed for the Mr. Web app when I was a sophomore <laughs> student in college, which may seem a little naive now, quite simple one. 
So the name of the app is Mr. Weather. Why? Because I feel like my app's main feature is I can uh, allow user to customize the notification trigger, right? You know, like some, like a human, I can just let you know in the right time. So I'm calling Mr. Weather, and then let's go. This is quite simple icon. And another reason is I don't really know how to use Sketch at that time. So this is the best thing I can do at that time already. Yeah. Then speaking of slogan, then at the beginning, the version I thought of uh, my slogan <laughs> is remind you to take an umbrella to add clothes just like your mom. So <laughs> that is something I thought in the very first beginning. But then I take a few seconds to thought about it. And something I feel it feels like this. I mean, your mom still love you so much. So <laughs> if you don't know about it, it's actually from a very old like uh, Chinese mirror commercial. Uh, the, style, uh, the, the story is like uh, elementary school students uh, whose like, mother sent like, two cans of like, this milk called Wang Wang, right? And the whole school students gathering together and say, wow, your mom loves you so much, <laughs> this kind of stuff. Now, some of you, wow, my very first slogan looks like the, this, this kind of stupid ass, yes, like, the, the vibe. So yeah, then now you get the idea of like uh, what I'm talking about here. Then so in the end, I made the slogan. So in Chinese, it's called "Nen zhi yin qing nen chun nen bi feng zhong yu xue." So like if direct translated to English would be like a, it's something like able to know the cloudy and sunny days, and also can avoid the rain, forest, and rain and snow times. Uh, more catchy in Chinese, I think. <laughs> yeah, this you got the idea. Mm. Okay, then here we finally released the app. We got all the things we need, then we passed all the design, develop, then promotion, and all these kind of things. Here we can finally release the app. So after the app had been released for a while, then I received a lot of like, uh, like media reports like, from different websites. And you can imagine like how happy, I'm sorry, you can imagine how happy a student can be, a year two student can be to receive such a feedback after you just release the app. That's a lot of this kind of cover at that time. So I was really happy when I saw this kind of reports from different websites. So the story goes here. Then do you think like I speak like I received so many like, positive reviews. So you will feel wow, I must have, like made a lot of money. <laughs> right? Then like I, I went to the top of my life already. Then yeah, let me show you a few more user reviews here. Like for example, this one. Like piss off. I read the tweet uh, this morning to bring the umbrella. <laughs> yeah. And the last two or three days have no rain on his talk, or something like uh, this is no. What a weather app should look like. And I don't know like which weather source is used. Like the weather temperature is not very accurate. It's useless. I cannot even call it as a weather app. Yeah, at that time, my, my face is just like this. So, yeah, I really like this sticker back. <laughs> yeah, but let me show like, a more users review again. I thought this one, uh, so like the interface is simple, and the animation is comfortable and smooth, and the data is rich and current. And looking at my review, it looks like the developer had a trust, but I'm really excited and then with the yeah, something like this. So the pages are comfortable, soft, and elegant, and cotton candy. <laughs> yeah, this kind of review is uh, sexy. Yeah, especially for the second, second stuff. That's why it's the sexiest to when they have ever. Yeah. So uh, some of you like this kind of comments. So at that time, I was like this sticker right here. So why? Because like, you know, like when I introduced all the ideas behind the sexy film, the, 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 the like the elegant, the intuitive, all the kind of stuff, you will feel, well, actually, there are some users, they can get it. They know your points, they, they, can, they can get it, they just can get it. They know that they are just like you. They know what you are trying to express. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just have one second here, it's just be strong. Don't be too happy when you receive positive reviews. Don't be too sad when you receive like, negative reviews. Uh, yeah, this is I feel is quite like, really one of the most important for me to be an indie developer because um, you will find some developers who feel they really understand you, 
and we really value the same thing as we do. So, yeah, that's a story from my very first app. Then you probably will wonder what's next. And as I mentioned, the, this is my very first app I developed in uh, 2016 and released in 2017. And that's like when I was still like college students. Then in 2017, I released my second app, it's called Donuts. Then it's uh, like quite a simple RSS app. Uh, with a lot of like modern features, I call the modern fish, like you can fully customize the ruler, it supports iCloud thing, all this kind of stuff. Then one point I miss is like after all this store is actually uh, Mr. Weather has been removed uh, from the app store before <laughs> because I use a free uh, it's just a free app and with donation model, but I just provide a button called like a you can buy the developer of coffee, you can buy him an apple, you can buy him a box of chicken, <laughs> this kind of options, right? Then, and my music is like, I, I link to my Alipay. <laughs> Apple just like super angry, like you cannot like, try to avoid using IEP and just delete my app. <laughs> so that's the ending of my very first app. Yeah, but yeah, besides like, then in 2019, uh, I released the list of weather too. So in this new version of Mr. Weather, I redesigned the interface. I improved a lot of things, uh, features, according to uh, user feedbacks from my first uh, version of Mr. Weather. And I also adapted some like Apple's new features, like the dark mode, and also widgets, all these kind of things. Yeah, this is some like, uh, uh, demo video of the Mr. Weather 2. Yeah, then in 2020, I released another app called As Progress. So in this app, you can track a lot of, it's quite still a simple app, and it's a, like a demo video of like several versions ago. And they're using different things to track all the like, events, progress, backwards. Then we even designed a new thing like, called Shanghai 2022. <laughs> like uh, quite a while ago, at that time, like, Shanghai is like, uh, where everyone's like stay at home, like, quarantine, this whole city locked down. So at that time, we just feel, wow, probably we can try to do something to, to recall this time, where the story of what's happening in Shanghai now. Yeah, then the last app is what I'm developing right now, and it's called, it's still underlying development, it's called Lockboard. Why it's called Lock? Because my name is Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, which is still designed and developed by myself. So this is a simple demo about uh, the window, window adjuster part. So it's not Mac OS or Windows, uh, it's actually on the iPad, it's the iPad app, and it runs on the iPad. So this app was all about to provide a desktop style, a multi-window workspace for users, that so you along the web apps. I feel most of my requirements can be satisfied by web apps, Twitter, Spotify, Linear, and this kind of stuff. Right? And yeah, it was fully designed for iPads. And, yeah. It's all under developing and fixing some bugs, but it's around 90% fixed. And this is something like that. You can do like uh, search functions, and you can simply just uh, search for different activities, like history, watch podcasts, and even do some search functions. For example, you can just type that in Singapore. Also, I feel this is quite a uh, funny one. It's, it's also works on the iPhone. So when you connect your iPhone, uh, AirPlay, or like one or two another external developer, uh, external display, then you can use it as a desktop computer. Then your iPhone screen will turn into a trackpad for you to operate. Yeah. So the motivation behind this is after I bought my iPad and found. It's still quite hard for me to finish solve my very simple workflow on the iPad OS. So because the window management feature just too limited, so I want to uh, build something like a workspace that uh, can be more flexible and powerful for like iPad users to finish some of their work. Okay, then yeah, if you want me to give you one more reason to make an indie uh, product or indie developer uh, for you as an engineer. I feel is, okay. yeah, 
some new technologies that you can try. Because in big companies, they, they, they really need to cover more users. Like for this one, I have some like <laughs> uh, new type, new things, new framework I want to see. But actually, back to the company, you need to like be adapt to this iOS 10. That's a long time ago, right? Yeah. And several new uh, things here. I feel like there's an indie developer you can uh, just build something to try. Then, yeah, for example, I'd like to the widget key, my Expo OS app. And also, I feel quite happy is that Google has been recommended by the iOS and macOS store for several times because of this. And also, it's for my very first time, my app was being shown on Apple's WWDC keynote. And you can find my icons here. When I see this happen, I was really happy because this is something I really didn't expect it will happen when I just started to do it. Yeah, then a few other reason is connections. Yeah, so back in 2020, I received my first invitation to attend an event hosted by Apple. It's called like, Design and Development Accelerator. So in that event and some following events, I really met a lot of developers and designers who love to develop their own indie apps just like me, and probably just like you. So I feel this is a very good opportunity for you to like, just make more connections. Something. Yeah. So, in the end, it's just one sentence. Uh, just become a creator, because I think this can be one of our way of leaving a mark on the world in the way you love. And thanks. That's all I'm going to share today. Yeah. So. products apps are made or you want to like uh, participate in the testing process of the new uh, app you can just uh, reach out to me on my Twitter I know it's called X and then log down nine six seven three I give you a phone <coughs> call or something you just can reach out to me anytime. Yeah. Thanks thank you very much. Alright guys welcome back and for our second talk we have Ildar. Yes. Yes, I read. All right, cool. Um, he's a principal engineer at Grafana Labs, and today he's going to be talking about his uh, startup journey and subsequently being re acquired by Grafana. So let's give him a round of applause, Hello. please. My name is Siddhar and indeed I'm principal engineer at Grafana Labs. And today I want to talk about my journey as a startup founder. And I want to talk to you uh, and tell how we built a product that was eventually acquired by Grafana Labs. I also want to speak a little bit about DevOps field and observability field in general. Uh, my startup was in the field of incident response management. So I want to tell you how big companies or any companies that have uh, in internet presence, how they run their applications in production. And I also want to speak about uh, the experience of migrating our small tool, uh, B2B, with tens of users to a huge user base of Grafana. And what tools we use to make sure the release will go smooth. <clears throat> a little bit about myself. Uh, I finished my university in 2016, and right after the university, I managed to uh, move to Silicon Valley and join Cisco Systems. I was able to do it because I was uh, constantly applying to different internships, and uh, I was studying in Moscow, and uh, one day I was lucky to get into the internship called uh, Cisco International Internships Program. And we had a lot of people from all over the world, including Singapore. And we all moved to Silicon Valley in the same building. We were living all together. And uh, there are like 75 buildings, huge buildings uh, of Cisco systems. And we all worked in these buildings. Uh, we had around 100,000 people overall. So that was a huge enterprise. 
And that was my probably one of the first working experiences where I learned how to actually build software and uh, how to deploy this software to a huge amount of people. And of course, uh, that was a completely different experience that I had in university. Uh, because uh, we had to deploy reliable software that were not crashing for our users. And uh, I learned word monitoring from the day one of uh, work at Cisco Systems. After working for a year, roughly for a year, uh, Cisco acquired another startup called Clicker. And I was very interested in these people. They came to our company and uh, they had kind of a little bit different vibe. Uh, I learned from the news that they got acquired for, for 200, $260 million. And I was like super impressed about that. And I really wanted to talk to the founder of that company and learn how they managed to do it because they made such a big impact to the industry that even Cisco decided to buy them. And I managed to switch teams and join this company uh, and help them transition to Cisco, help them feel welcome. And that was a big inspiration for me. Uh, by the time I was living in London, uh, I was working from London office and uh, I had a uh, I had a business travel and I went back to Silicon Valley and in the office I bumped uh, with my old old friend who I was uh, knowing for whole my pretty, pretty much all my life uh, and uh, it happened he was also working in Cisco systems in Silicon Valley and we started speaking with him and one day, uh, we came with the idea that there is something wrong in the current market of incident response management and reliability. And uh, there were a few big companies with uh, pretty uh, mature products, but for some reason, we understood that uh, even though heads of companies pretty much happy with that product, uh, the end users, developers, are not happy with that product because it was difficult to configure. It was not giving as much insight. And later I'll be explaining more what is incident management and how it affects end users, how it affects developers. Because uh, I'll give a little, a, a small hint, the incident management software usually calls developers on the night because they are on call. Uh, they're usually on call for the product and they get these calls in the night and it's very annoying. And we decided to disrupt the, this market and invent something else. Uh, that's how we decided to start a new company. Uh, we both left uh, Cisco and uh, my co-founder, he already left Cisco a few months before and he managed to work <coughs> in another startup in California. Uh, so we had pretty good experience of working in uh, big companies where we had uh, 100,000 people and my friend, my co-founder, he also worked in the same company. Then I moved to a company inside startup and my friend moved to a startup where we got the experience as developers in smaller companies. And I think that helped us uh, and made us ready for starting our own company. So together, uh, uh, two people started a startup called a mixer and um, we were working hard on that product and uh, I'll be talking about uh, different stages we went through when we were developing it and uh, we get our first success uh, after joining 500 startups in San Francisco it gave uh, it gave us a lot of uh, benefits I'll be talking about them on my next slides and eventually we joined Grafana and I moved to Singapore. I moved to Singapore around like a little bit more than a year ago and I really love this city. Uh, it's very welcoming, it's, it's, it's a little bit hot and, but I, I totally, I definitely say that I fell in love with this place. Well, uh, that's uh, what you probably can see in my LinkedIn or everybody's LinkedIn. But in fact, uh, what I did is 
I just built a SaaS product uh, and I sold it to a bigger company. Uh, what I can say, I don't support when founders uh, sell their company on pretty much early stage and uh, show it as a huge win of pretty much all of their life. This is not cool. But I hope that my small story will be inspiring for you as uh, students, as early professional uh, uh, in your early career. And uh, why it is insp inspirational for me? Because uh, in two years, I managed to build a product with my team uh, that was zero. And in two years, we were deploying my product, our product, to thousands and thousands of users. And uh, it's, it's really inspiring. So, uh, as you saw on previous slide, there was my LinkedIn, and uh, the reality is my GitHub, because I still I'm still developer. Uh, I code every day. You see the history of my commit, and uh, one of the best decisions uh, to sell the company to Grafana was that Grafana is the company of my dreams. Uh, it's almost fully open source. And everything that I do contributes to my career because anybody can share their LinkedIn, sh share their PRs, and uh, you pretty much don't even need to go through interview with the company because you have everything in your pocket and you can just ask to check your uh, LinkedIn, uh, GitHub and see your PRs. That's a very big point to join companies that have uh, open source presence, especially when you're a young professional. Uh, it's very easy to prove uh, your input into the success of the company. Uh, a few words about Grafana. Uh, we are a fully remote company. Uh, I, I have a lot of questions about Grafana Singapore. And uh, in fact, we have all the people in pretty much any place in the world, because we try to hire the best professionals in the world. And uh, in Singapore, we have uh, not that many people, of course, but still uh, some. And uh, uh, anybody can join us from any part of the world. That's our strength. Uh, and what our company does in fact, that our company just helps other developers, uh, DevOps, SREs, uh, all the technical people, and even in some cases business people, uh, to run their applications, to run their infrastructure, uh, to run their whole software in a more reliable way, uh, to run and develop faster, to innovate faster and don't worry about the uh, reliability and we cover our, uh, the company's back uh, with our product. And uh, let me quickly explain uh, the field. By the way, uh, does anybody know Grafana? Does anybody uh, know what is DevOps, observability? Do we have any users of Grafana here? Okay, uh, I hope uh, uh, does anybody use any other observability tools? Uh, who monitors uh, their software? Uh, okay, uh, then if not now, then I'm pretty sure if you select the uh, developer career, you 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 know you will know what what it uh, what it means and how it works. Okay. Uh, So uh, I wanted to give a few words about what is DevOps and what is SRE. DevOps uh, consists of two words, developers and operations. And SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. Uh, and uh, they are pretty much similar terms. And uh, some, sometimes people kind of confuse it. And uh, pretty much every developer has their own opinion on what these terms mean. So I'll try to. Uh, use Wikipedia and uh, some common sense uh, to try to explain what uh, these terms mean. Uh, so DevOps is a methodology uh, 
uh, on how to do the development of the uh, different software. And uh, previously, there were two different roles in the companies. First is a developer, the person who writes code, and then they kind of package somehow zip archives uh, packages and uh, ship them to operations person. They were usually in the different room or different office, and uh, these people uh, then read the documentation, uh, deploy that package somewhere, test, uh, see if it's working. Uh, they would probably have a few iterations uh, on that process, and eventually it goes into production. And uh, previously it was uh, taking a few weeks, a few months, a long time. And it, was, it, 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 it made a lot of sense because uh, there was no internet, uh, there were not much uh, uh, e-commerce, and there was not too, that much money uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in that field. But now it's very important to ship fast. And uh, it, uh, if, you, if, you, if your time to production, if your time to, uh, if, you, if, you're, if your time to production is short, then it means your feature goes faster and you can be faster than your competitor. You can give the better service to your customers. And it's uh, very important. That's why this uh, methodology uh, came up. And uh, basically what it did, it combined both these uh, words into one person. And companies started kind of hiring uh, a person who knows both these words, uh, development and operations. And they know how to code. They know how to deploy stuff. And uh, also, it's not only about the person who knows both these words. It's also about the tools. And it's also about the practices. Because, uh, for example, uh, there were no such uh, products such as continuous delivery and continuous deployment software. Does anybody know what is CI CD and what are the possible tools for CI CD? Good. Uh, more people know about that. Uh, I really like it. And uh, yeah, uh, so different companies started working on some development tools. Uh, that helped uh, contribute to this uh, DevOps methodology. And uh, they uh, tried to automate all that interactions between dev and ops. Uh, it made uh, the number of efforts that persons should make much less. And now they can combine both of these knowledges in one person. And one person can do the whole this cycle for uh, the company. And now, in the modern companies, uh, most of the DevOps de developers know how to uh, ship uh, things in production, and uh, most of uh, developers know how to fix something that is happening on production, how to find some information about the code they uh, ship and the code they, they develop. And in order to do that, uh, to, in order to help these people, uh, companies started to develop different products. Uh, well, that's about DevOps. Uh, I'll touch DevOps on my next slide. And a few words about SRE. SRE is a uh, very commonly used uh, term now, SRE engineer, site reliability engineer. Uh, and if you go to uh, the uh, job board, you, you'll probably see that there are uh, same amount of DevOps needed and same amount of site reliability engineers needed. Uh, and uh, basically what site reliability uh, methodology is, is a, the, just a set of rules that, from my perspective, built on top of DevOps. Uh, that's uh, a methodology that were populated by, uh, popularized by uh, Google, and that basically how they do uh, the uh, DevOps for uh, all the Google services, and it became, suddenly became very popular among other companies. And uh, there's just a set of strict rules how to do uh, DevOps in the companies.
Well, uh, one of the, if I go back a little bit, uh, one of the crucial parts of uh, uh, DevOps uh, is monitoring, uh, because it's uh, pretty clear that the developer, it all starts from planning and coding, uh, what developers and product engineers, product managers do, they plan what to do, uh, they code, and then if that's uh, the code that needs to be built, they build it. Uh, of course, they test it for the quality control, and uh, it helps uh, to find the issues that my customers face uh, before the code actually goes to production, and there is a whole big world of uh, uh, testing tools, then we use CI CD systems to make a release and make a deploy. Uh, then we uh, deploy something on the uh, cloud service provider, uh, bare metal servers, data centers, wherever. And then once we have some piece of code running, we need to monitor it and we need to get all the possible information uh, out of this data in order to find insights by ourselves, not by our customers. Because imagine you are a developer and you uh, know that you build a bad, bad software from your uh, vice president or from your customer, that's uh, really bad. So what developers usually try to do, they try to set up good monitoring so they know that something is not working before actually customers know about, uh, tell about that and complain about that. And uh, there is a term, a wider term for uh, that monitoring that is called observability. Observability is, a, a, is a, a reason here, uh, is that it's the ability to measure and understand the internal state of the system, of the software, uh, by examining its outputs. And what are the possible outputs of the application? Uh, who knows the answer to this question? Okay, it seems probably get a little bit complicated, but that's fine. Uh, basically, what uh, every application uh, emits is, uh, of course, logs. Uh, everybody knows what logs uh, are, right? That's just some journaling that uh, application says, hey, I'm kind of trying to, to do that, I'm trying to do that, and so on. Uh, the second uh, important thing that uh, application outputs is metrics. For example, CPU usage, mm, disk usage, uh, memory usage, and much more. Uh, a little, a little bit more, kind of uh, unusual but very important metrics are uh, rate of uh, successful requests versus rate of failed requests. Uh, that's one of the most important metrics for the applications that are running in production. And traces. Uh, traces is uh, a piece of information that we get from the running process. And we basically see uh, what uh, all the stack traces of the, of the application, how the code actually executes. Uh, so these are three pillars of observability. These are three main outputs that uh, we have from application. And we can get a lot of insights uh, out of this data. And, uh, what we do here at Grafana Labs, we have two concepts. We have a concept called shift left and shift right. And shift left, it means that we have this DevOps thing and we kind of try to prevent uh, that situation from happening. And we use a lot of testing, we use uh, different things to uh, make sure that uh, we know about the problems before uh, actually the, the application went to production and it uh, is used by the real customer. Uh, and the uh, shift right approach is that uh, even when we already released our version of software to production, we constantly monitor it and uh, we put some alerts which are kind of uh, thresholds for logs, metrics, and when something unusual is happening, uh, including like we use some rules, including AI rules, to understand that something is misbehaving. And in this case, uh, we start some uh, we start some emergency plans 
recovery plans. And I'll be talking about that a little bit uh, later on my next slides. Well, uh, important thing about observability is that it, can, it should be uh, deployable as code. So you can go find in and click uh, the configuration in the UI. But what developers love is to configure it as code. So you can just kind of uh, configure all your rules, uh, all your configurations to get these logs, metrics, traces, and your load testing rules as code and just upload it to GitHub and it will be applied to everywhere automatically. That's very important uh, case uh, that is generally called uh, infrastructure as a code. Uh, so like uh, over here in this particular case, it's called observability as code. Uh, and uh, I already touched it. Uh, we have uh, uh, the whole Grafana observability stack can be deployed manually. It can be deployed by you. It can be deployed by f for free uh, because most of Grafana is open source. But we need to earn money too. And uh, our customers don't want to uh, do the deployments and stuff by their own. So we provide a version in cloud where we manage all that stuff by ourselves and our customers just conveniently come and use uh, the application. Uh, yeah, that's uh, an example how uh, the metrics, logs, uh, and traces can look like in Grafana. Uh, we can uh, display different information such as health of your service. We can display business metrics. Uh, and it's, uh, it usually gives uh, many insights to product teams, to, uh, to executives, and uh, to developers. So I already touched uh, what is the incident response management. And basically, that's a plan, uh, emergency plan, when something is going wrong. Uh, and uh, it's very important for the company to be prepared for such situations. Uh, it's important to have a well-defined runbook of the steps who is going to be notified if something is not working. Uh, does anybody face any situation when uh, the very important mobile application is not working here? <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, that's uh, what usu people usually do is that they configure the uh, plan, emergency plan for such situations. If something is not working, we see that metrics go uh, down or they go up. For example, the most kind of simple cases, uh, CPUs go up and they start throttling on 100%. And we can put the rule, if my CPUs are higher than 95%, send the uh, notification to an on-call engineer. And uh, teams usually have rotations and saying like, yes, this engineer is going to be uh, on call on Mondays. Another engineer will be on call on uh, other Mondays. And uh, the third engineer will be on call on uh, Sundays. And uh, that's uh, how we make sure that this situation won't be lost. And somebody will react upon that as soon as possible. And uh, we try to achieve uh, the case when all the uh, alerts are happening before customers know that something is going wrong. Because there sh usually it takes a little bit time. Uh, it's all have cas cascading effect. For example, if one of your services is taking all the CPUs, you have like half an hour to fix it. Otherwise, your other service will not be able to process something. Well, uh, here is the application that uh, I'm working on. Uh, that's just one page uh, where we have uh, our on-call engineers. And you see, uh, we try to follow the sun. It means that we, as we are uh, the company, a very distributed company around the world, we can uh, make our engineers on-call only on their daytime. <coughs> so they don't have to be on-call on the night, which is really cool. And what every company should try to uh, achieve that. And you see, we have rotations. For example, Arman is going to be on call uh, at 
second part of September, like Monday, and they are uh, rotating with each other, like all, the, all, all these people. And uh, we configure it like if the number of uh, successful requests is the, ra the ratio of successful requests goes below some point, it means that some of our services is not working correctly, then the alert will go and uh, page somebody who is on call according to this rotation. And our application will make sure to reach that person. It, it will send a push notification to the phone. Uh, it will push, send a push notification that even can uh, break through. Do not disturb mode. It will do the phone call. It will send the SMS message. And we have like 15 different ways of notifying uh, people. That's what we did. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what the uh, that's uh, what my startup eventually became. And uh, I want to quickly go through uh, the startup stage of this product. Uh, when I was working in a huge uh, company, uh, I was watching a, move, uh, like a series, uh, Silicon Valley, and I really liked the humor there. And honestly, for me, it was uh, uh, like I was, I was really trying to follow that story. And uh, uh, what I also want to say that uh, there can, what I will say uh, next is kind of survivorship based bias, because uh, what worked for me might not work for you. But I really encourage you to uh, try to build startup because it's like uh, you, you basically. Uh, if you if you if you do a startup and it succeed, even if you just join another company, it gives you a big step forward in your career, and uh, it's uh, it's really a good feeling when you made your best to build a product, and it's now available to so many people, especially in open source. And uh, when I was working on startup, uh, I went through different stages. Uh, when I just like started startup, you see the baseline, and uh, when we just started talking about this idea, it was so cool. Like, yeah, we found so many hacks how to make this product, like how to make it so cool. We were so sure that it will uh, bury our all our competitors, and everybody will start using us. But uh, then we realized that we are just two people, and we're just trying to code something. And uh, we were doing a lot of experiments. We were doing a lot of uh, building. Uh, we were trying to find uh, the right customer. We were selling it like crazy, and we were coding it in the night. And uh, um, I want to. Uh, and usually, you do it, uh, and you kind of delete a lot of your code. You create uh, another code from scratch, and. Uh, you try to build a product, and uh, it's not usually working uh, from the very beginning. You have to go through ups and downs. You have to uh, go through a lot of uh, things. So don't think it's uh, very easy to do, uh, but uh, never give up, because it's, uh, uh, it's what's happening to every startup founder. I spoke to so many people who were doing their startups, and they are uh, that's, that's, that's happened to everybody. And then you see the hockey stick. Uh, it's usually when you find uh, your product market fit and uh, it go up. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we also joined Grafana and it help, uh, helped us to get this hockey stick much earlier. Uh, also, when we were doing startup, uh, I watched uh, like <laughs> uh, three things have helped me to build startup. First, of course, uh, I spoke and I joined the team who recently joined uh, Cisco. Uh, second is uh, a series, Silicon Valley. And I read the book Lean Startup and learned about high cycles, like hypothesis, action, uh, what else, decision, and insights. And you kind of go get, you, you figure out the hypothesis, you do some action, you get data, uh, you get insights, and start again. Like, you always need to make sure you're not kind of inventing something that is not uh, needed to the market and is not needed to users. You always have to make sure that some of your metrics uh, goes up 
like usage or whatever. And uh, just a few words about uh, equity, how to raise money. Uh, usually when you just start, you uh, raise from FFF, fools, family and friends. And uh, that's, uh, they, people usually call them angels. And uh, uh, before like even having a product, it's almost impossible to do. So I was doing it on my, on what, whatever I saved from my salary. Uh, and uh, then uh, I was able to raise pre-seed with help of uh, Accelerator. I was uh, part of Accelerator 500 startups. And uh, I, if we have time, I'll tell a little bit about that too. Uh, and one of the most important things for me as a developer was uh, not using fancy technologies uh, because you have to carry a about a lot of things outside uh, actual engineering. You have to care about customers, marketing, HR, like a lot of things. And uh, that's uh, why uh, for me worked uh, the concept of boring technology. So you use the technology that you know very good. And who knows what is this architecture, how, how, how this architecture called? Uh, yeah, it's just client server architecture, like the most simple thing. We built on Django, like the most kind of uh, popular used stack. Uh, first of all, because I knew how it worked uh, very well, and I kind of feel that it's, it will be easier to get developers uh, because uh, yeah, you. You need to find the technology that is uh, used across the, uh, uh, by, by, by a lot of developers and you make sure that uh, it's, it's easier to find the Python developer than to find the Clojure developer or whoever. Uh, so boring technology is a very nice concept. Just Google it. Uh, there is a nice uh, slides and nice uh, presentation about that concept. Uh, of course, find the early users. There is a book called Crossing the Chasm, and uh, you always have to uh, make sure you are not <coughs> doing the product for yourself. Do product for you for your users. Find early adopters. Uh, find uh, use some guerrilla techniques to find these users. We did like some crazy things that were outstanding, and nobody did it. Like just going through all the public GitHub repos and trying to talk to. Uh, users uh, that we believe uh, can start using us we are PRs I don't know whatever example you can imagine and that all really helped us because uh, there was a big chance that we built something that is not needed uh, yeah I spoke about real tactics uh, use some creative ways of doing something with minimal cost and maximum impact uh, for example uh, for fundraising we we could make a market analysis uh, to support our uh, like pitch deck, but what we did instead, we realized that one of our competitors goes uh, goes uh, public, and they published some of uh, the information about the market, and we just reused it. And uh, in marketing, we used Slack a lot uh, and we made our Slack application. In HR we wrote uh, a very different uh, uh, text in the job board and we get a few developers who told us that they came to uh, this unknown startup just because we uh, did a good text there. Uh, we joined uh, 500 startups and uh, it definitely was beneficial but you cannot always join top tier accelerator from scratch. And what we did, uh, we both worked in Silicon Valley, we worked in London, and uh, we all had some networking, and we built our own accelerator. So basically, we asked uh, our acquaintances, friends, just to join our biweekly calls or monthly calls, where we try, were trying to kind of tell what are we planning to do, what are our metrics. We trusted them, they trusted us, and they were giving their insights, and it was kind of beneficial even pre-accelerator. So the networking, and network is very important thing, uh, was for our, for our in our experience. Uh, and the last part of my talk uh, is uh, how after the startup stage, we had uh, a challenge uh, to uh, deploy our product in front of 
thousands and thousands and thousands of users. Uh, in Grafana, in cloud, we had tens of data centers, hundreds of servers, and thousands of customers. Now, of course, it's a very different case uh, for the SaaS. And uh, what we did, uh, we did uh, horizontal scaling, we reworked our architecture, we fit kind of, we made it fit, fit into the rest of Grafana architecture, so it all works uh, with each other uh, good. So that's what we had to do. Uh, and uh, we, of course, used our own uh, stack, observability stack. For example, uh, we have, I don't know, 50 customers now, but imagine that we have to go to 10,000 customers overnight. And what do what you do? You configure the load test. And we kind of simulated the load from the uh, same load as we have from our 50 customers, but I know 200 times more. And it helped us predict uh, what uh, should we improve, uh, what are our bottlenecks, uh, how we, we checked if our capacity planning was correct. And uh, we configured our metrics, logs, traces, so we could quickly analyze them and uh, make the necessary fixes. Uh, that's all my talk. I tried to be quick, uh, but if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer that questions. that uh, there is like, uh, it goes up, it goes down, uh, and in emotional uh, way, it's also kind of same. And when I go up, like when I'm super positive about what we're doing, my co-founder could go a little bit down and vice versa. So we all kind of gave our back to each other and we were at least like, if we had these fluctuations, but the uh, the whole startup was going pretty much straight because we were kind of, even if we had some personal kind of, you know, you uh, have lack of motivation sometimes. Uh, that's uh, happening to every person. Then your kind of co-founder helps you and uh, uh, co-founder works, works more. And then uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's really important to find the right co-founder uh, and you can trust him. Yeah, we have uh, bubble tea uh, to the best question. Yeah. I don't think this is the best question, but who is your co-founder? Um, my co-founder is uh, a great engineer. Uh, his name is Matvei Kukui. Uh, he is based in Israel. And uh, we know each other, like, first time I met him when I was seven years old. and But we got separated uh, and uh, then second time we met in Silicon Valley in San Jose, California. Please, uh, do you use Kubernetes to do this? Yes, we do Kubernetes very extensively. We did use Kubernetes in our kind of startup stage, but that was completely different Kubernetes. Uh, you know, <laughs> I feel like I know about Kubernetes so much now after we kind of worked with Grafana Cloud. Uh, we even have, yeah, I, I won't share like details, not to overwhelm people, but uh, yeah, come apply to Grafana and you'll see the, the deepest internals of Kubernetes ever. Do you have advices for someone uh, who's thinking of starting a startup? Yeah, uh, I have an advice. Uh, just. Don't worry about the product that much. Like, just start and then uh, start talking to the people who you think that going to be your customers, and they will help you to uh, form the the product. So, uh, 
it's it's happening a lot when you try thinking, overthinking about the product and eventually not build it. But if you only start, you know, when we started building a mixer, it was like completely different thing uh, compared to what it happened and what it ended up. So I would recommend uh, to speak to your early customers uh, to speak, uh, and you you'll understand what you want to, to do and what you need to do. <coughs> Yes? Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, I'm not a software guy, but you know, I'm a chip designer, hardware guy. And usually when we protect our IP rights, we file patterns and stuff like this. So I was just wondering from the software side, how do you guys prevent competitors from doing the same thing oh. as you and copy the same market? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, do I get the T? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question, uh, but I would forward it to our legal. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll try to answer it. Uh, the nice thing about open source is that if the code is open source, even if our competitors use our code, they need to contribute it back. And if uh, it, it really contributes to whole community, because we kind of started the project, if somebody will use it and not give it back, then it's like, uh, uh, it shouldn't be happening according to our license. We expect everybody to come come in back. I think everybody just uh, open source community is really kind of fair. They all come in back. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a really, really good question too. Oh, everybody has good questions. Do we have smaller containers so we share? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, what uh, you know, uh, the whole product is about uh, making sure that the corporates uh, are not going down and continue serving kind of their customers and not lose money. That's pretty much about money. But what I was trying to achieve when I was building this software and our team was building that, that software is to think about our end users because we actually call developers in the night and you get a very nasty <laughs> sound on your phone if something is broken on your infrastructure. And it affects you, it affects your family. And uh, that's very important to make sure we call only one person at the right time, uh, preferably in the daytime, not in the night. And uh, uh, that was my own pain, that probably why I built this startup too, because I was tired of getting these phone calls from our competitors. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's my answer. Yes? Yes, uh, the nice thing about my own, what the project that I'm working on is that it's better to keep that to outside your infrastructure because if your infrastructure is down, that's our main use case to track if your infrastructure is down, stop operating. Then it should be outside and made calls. So people prefer using cloud because imagine your whole server is down and our product is also on the server and it never called it uh, and notified it. So that's why people prefer using cloud version of the product. So it will track and make necessary actions when it's uh, found, found that something can go wrong. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Like all of the big companies and big names are doing the 
a job. For example, uh, I just uh, know about the product, but uh, I, I knew that uh, some related tools to monitor like AWS uh, CloudWatch. What is a better option like, uh, to compete with them? Right? Uh, is it uh, better to try to improve what they do or like offering some uh, extra options? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, repeating for the for all, uh, how to uh, how to understand what to build uh, when you're competing with the existing player with mature product. Ask your customers. You certainly have to have some founder vision on the on the things and you have to set up uh, your your vision and your uh, kind of uh, yeah your, your vision, but you have to constantly speak to customers and uh, find the need. I would say probably it might work for me. Uh, find some one critical piece that is important for the small group of people to make them friends, start speaking to them, and then. Uh, you're going to speak to innovators who, who are 2.5% of all your user base. Then you can start selling to them and slowly build a uh, feature that will be interesting for early adopters and then uh, features for the bigger uh, part of your potential customers. Yes? Sometimes customers don't know what is good, but they don't but they do know what is bad. So for example for an app, if they know that it is not useful, they will just uninstall it. But sometimes before they have encountered an app that is good enough, they don't know what is good. So before they see iPhone, maybe they, they never bought one. They never know what is good. So how do we ask them constructive question to let them know what they want? In the sense that maybe in the background that they didn't even have an idea of what they want. Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, there are different products, uh, and uh, there is a difference when you build the product for uh, like B2C segment or B2B, and uh, it depends on the. Uh, it depends on how big the market is. If you can afford like having, if you have a flow of like 100 new customers or new users per day, you can just burn them. And uh, uh, if they didn't like something, yeah, just like test your hypothesis on them and just burn them. But if the market is not that big, uh, you have to, you know, uh, there are some marketing strategies such as uh, like uh, it depends on how you find them uh, and uh, it you have to be an uh, um, influencer like you have to give them some opinion like your product should be opinionated telling them how to do things and they should trust you and uh, you and your authority Something, something like that, but it really depends on like, a lot of variables. Okay. So, on to, uh, throughout the session, you mentioned about talking to customers, right? Yes. To get understand more about what to offer. But as you know, right? I mean, as a startup, why would the customer bother to talk to you? So the challenge of approaching somebody and really getting an input, I mean, why would they bother? How would you overcome this challenge? Do you do surveys or online or something like that? We had not that big market, like not that we had we, we had like uh, a flow. From the beginning we employed some really nice marketing strategy. We uh, back in time Slack, the messenger was kind of gaining the popularity. I mean we uh, added a Slack application to the market. So people just naturally kind of find this app, install it, and 
that's a good um, driver to start talking to them. That was the first thing that kind of worked pretty much good for us. And that's an example of that guerrilla kind of style. You do some conventional things, you have to find like, how to get to these people. And also, the second uh, uh, strategy we had is bottom up, when we knew how then to do that developers key, and we could kind of reach to them, start talking to them, get some ideas from them, uh, implement them into in our product. And after that, they kind of really appreciate that we did that for, for them. And uh, it's a lot of uh, power. We had a lot of power in strength, word of mouth. Like they just share with their league, they switch companies, they go to conferences and they always like speak about their good experience. That's how we had this growing like uh, user base uh, or community of early developers and new way to help us use the product. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, so so late for two.